Welcome to the Daily Horror Habit Podcast. I'm your host, Jay Krieger, bringing you daily reviews of current and classic horror movies for your twisted pleasure. Be aware that these reviews and discussions may include spoilers. And as always, I hope you enjoy. Reporting accounts of the dead turning to life. What's that? You can't talk about it. What is this about, Jason? This turned out to be a big thing. I just want to record it. The problem doesn't seem to be that people are waking up dead. The dead people are waking up. Today's episode of Daily Horror Habit takes a look at the zombie godfather himself, George A. Romero's first foray into the found footage genre with Diary of the Dead, which is currently streaming on Tubi TV. Released in 2007, Diary of the Dead is the fifth entry in Romero's Dead series, though it isn't a direct sequel to Land of the Dead. Rather, it exists within its own zombie universe, taking place on the night of the outbreak. A group of college students are making a monster movie in the woods when they hear the news. The dead are rising and feasting upon the flesh of the living. Now, film student Jason, played by Joshua Close, and a group of survivors document their journey across Pennsylvania in search of survivors, family, and a chance to survive. And joining me to talk all things found footage in the undead is returning friend of the show, Bernie. Bernie, welcome back to the show, man. I appreciate you having me back, man. We uh, we have a very... Uh, unique movie uh, to to discuss here, and I'm excited to dig into it with you. Yeah, there's definitely parallels between Diary of the Dead and the film that we talked about last, which was The Taking of Deborah Logan, in that they both have the documentary-style feel to them and structure to it. Of course, one of them deals with demonic possession and Diary of the Dead very much deals with zombies and the like. Um, Mm -hmm. So I'm interested to kind of get into the parallels that we see in it, but also just seeing how Romero handles the found footage genre. I mean, he is a storied filmmaker. His films, the legacy precedes the man and whatnot, but it's always interesting when you see somebody, especially a director that comes from like an old school of filmmaking, tackling a very new genre, right? I mean, when he started making films and even 20 years into his career, Found footage was not really a thing. It was not an established genre that he came up with. I'm interested to kind of hear how you think he handled that and merging that genre that he basically is the godfather of, which is the zombie film. So how do you Mm -hmm. think that uh, Romero handled that in uh, adapting to the genre? So I think it's really interesting when we have these conversations, we, we start to like pick up on different themes that maybe directors or certain genres of film have. Um, and specifically with Romero, we picked that up in Night of the Living Dead and Land of the Dead, where we saw that there was an underlying theme or an underlying message throughout the movie, whether it's related to, you know, a sense of inequality in Night of the Living Dead, um, you know, a couple unique ones in Land of the Dead. In this one, I think if you look at it just through the lens of a horror movie, there are certainly some some scary scenes, but this is one of the more lower quality zombie movies that he's made. But if you think of like, what is the actual underlying message that he had in this, which this is a 2007 movie, and he's talking about the issues that pertain to the news and how no one really trusts it anymore and how anybody with a camera can basically become a newsmaker. And you can get it kind of addicted to that as the uh, 
the, the director, filmmaker in this, so to speak, uh, Jason Creed's character uh, does. So um, I thought it was just, it was a very unique take on the genre. There were definitely some pluses that I, I liked. I mean, there were pros and cons on both sides, but I thought overall it was a very, very good movie. Yeah, it was. I was very skeptical going into this, right? You told me, hey, we should, this is on Tubi now, it's available, we should watch it and talk about it. I was super skeptical, I'll be honest, just because, I mean, I'm a huge Romero fan, but at the same time, this sort of period of his career, and I believe that the last two films that he made before his death were this and Survival of the Dead. And from what I've kind of just read online or been aware of it online, like it, these two films are not revered nearly as much as the rest of his career. So there was that, but then also, I didn't really know how he was gonna be able to adapt his sort of sensibilities and social commentary and things into the found footage genre from mm -hmm. afar. And it was probably ignorance on my part. It was more like, oh, is this guy just trying to apply what he already does and sort of cash in on this new fad uh, genre? Obviously, it that's not my overall feelings on found footage genre. If uh, our conversations over the last weeks and months have been uh, an indication of that, but this is just sort of my ignorant perception of it from afar. Mm -hmm. And so I was very surprised and excited by the fact that this feels like a Romero film. It, yeah. Nothing is really lost in his transitioning from his traditional cinematic style to the found footage genre. And that was very, very reassuring in terms of the trajectory of the film and how it is constructed in a way that you really get a lot of his sort of social commentaries and influences. But also, this is a zombie movie that is primed for found footage. It's mm -hmm. not sort of, I mean, one of the themes that we've been coming back to are this idea that do certain films need to be told in the found footage genre, or are they just sort of generic stories that are being adapted to the found footage format? And this film, I think, is much like The Taking of Deborah Logan, is indicative of a film that is the right type of story to be told within found footage uh, format and presentation. Mm -hmm. No, 100%. I mean, I think we mentioned this during our conversation about the Blair Witch, right? where how does technology play a role in the, the outcome of these movies? And I mean, to that effect, I think George Romero did a really good job of incorporating technology here where he needed to. And it's, again, back in 2007, you see like the, I remember, I think it was a Samsung or an LG phone where you could like, you know, it kind of flips open and then the screen goes to the side. I'm pretty sure I had one of those. Mm -hmm. Back then that was like, you know, that was the modern technology. And we look at that now 10, 13 years later, and it's like, you know, I, I don't know if I'd let like a little kid utilize that. It's way too <laughs> um, So it was very interesting to see how they utilize that tech. Um, but to, but just to that effect, I mean, would you, would you rank this out of the Romero films that you've seen even in his like top five? I wouldn't, but I think that just speaks to how strong his filmography is, right? Mm -hmm. I think that, and I, I wouldn't even necessarily rank this film amongst my favorite found footage films, but that's not a knock against the movie. I think that this is very unique in the way that it, the sort of found footage avenue that it goes down where it has this documentary structure to it. And mm -hmm. then incorporating a zombie movie that actually has some pretty creative kills in it, in addition to that, um, it makes this one of the more notable found footage movies, and it's definitely stronger than I thought it would be, um, even if it's not necessarily one of my favorites. But something that I was really impressed with, impressed with with this movie is how Romero tackles the role of like emerging media. And apparently, like he had the idea for this film previous to Land of the Dead, and so to see him have this idea around like probably 2004 or something like that before Land of the Dead came out and to have the film deal with so much relevant subject matter, even in 2021, I think it really speaks to Romero's ability to have a very sort of like boots on the ground approach to social issues and the ways in which, I mean, especially in this instance, technology, how that really has an effect in altering society and people's sensibilities and sort of this growing distrust, I mean, his work has always had an underlying theme of like distrust of the government, right? Whether it was this film he made in the 70s called The Crazies, 
or if it's even in like Dawn of the Dead where the military flies overhead at one point or something. I, I can't remember if that's the remake or not, but like the military basically never shows up or the government never shows up to save anybody. They're mm -hmm. just as sort of like disorganized as the rest of us. And so he's always kind of had this anti-authority undertone to some of his works, especially mm -hmm. in something like Day of the Dead. Um, and so to see him really take that in a more modern context and to have it feel as if it's touching upon things that aren't dated at all, yeah. that was very impressive to me in a way that really makes this a standout, I think, in terms of found footage films. But even at the end of the day, if it's not necessarily one of my favorites, it's just surprising to me that a movie made in 2007 can still yeah. feel as relevant um, as it does. And I mean, we see that with the way the film opens, right? We kind of have this film crew that's capturing the zombie outbreak, right? Mm. And so we, the viewer, that's our first introduction. They're filming, there's like, there were, the police were responding to this guy that killed his wife and his son. From afar, that's like a horrific crime. But then we realize like, oh, they were probably infected and he was trying to put them down and right. yet didn't actually kill them. Um, mm. And so I think that that's interesting because the film opening with that, it's irrefutable that is proof that the dead are rising and yet when the the students that we meet later in the film who end up being our core protagonists they don't see that they hear it on the radio and what's the first thing people do when they hear something on the radio they don't believe it or right. they just kind of discount what's happening and so mm -hmm. i think that's an interesting way to sort of set the mood and set the film up is that hey here's a first-hand account and you should only ever um respond to first-hand accounts of information or on the inverse of that i guess it's more so like people are only inclined to believe what they see rather than what they hear um, and i think that that's just a really interesting way for romero to uh kickstart the film i mean we we see that now and through the stuff that we're living in as, as we speak right um so i mean it, the thing that was so unique to me in this movie um and that Again, I mentioned I there are some pros that I really like about this movie, but there are also some relatively significant cons. One of them is, I think this is the first Romero movie that I watched that I had zero connection with any of the characters. Yeah, I had, 100%. I, it, you know, like there was absolutely no, for lack of a better term, there was no fucks given on if any of the character died, right? Like, uh, you know, we talked about this earlier, like I have, a small affinity to the professor just because I enjoy anyone who gets fucked up during those kind of, uh, <laughs> those types of movies. Um, it has some kind of, a uh, uh, semi interesting kind of view on things that are going on. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, if you look back really in every single Romero movie, famous one or non-famous one, again, you mentioned the crazies, a whole host of zombie ones. There's always one or two characters that really stick out. Was that similar to you that you just had no connection to any of them or you were, uh, you had a lack of a connection rather? Yeah, this is definitely, and I don't know if it is his script or if it is just the fact that these, most of these actors are stage actors. Mm -hmm. From what I had read, I had read that he specifically sought out stage actors because unlike a lot of traditional found footage films, Romero chose to go with the cinematographer instead of having the actors themselves film it. And he'd said that he wanted to avoid something similar to the Blair Witch Project because he found like the realism in the camera, like shaking and things like that. He found that off putting. And so he wanted to avoid that. He went with the cinematographer who actually shot the different scenes and whatnot. Um, and so because of that, he chose stage actors. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know if it is state, the result is stage actors that their performances just did not translate to film in a way, or is it what they were working with? But either way, it doesn't really matter because like you, I didn't care about any of the characters. I didn't find any of them all that interesting or sympathetic. Um, mm -hmm. Like you said, the professor is probably a standout who uh, his name was Andrew Maxwell, who's played by Scott Wentworth. His most defining trait is that he gets shit faced for three fourths of the movie. And then the last fourth, he uses a bow and arrow and domes a couple of zombies, which is awesome. And we'll get into like the zombie effects and the kills and things like that uh, mm -hmm. later. But in terms of characters, even like our protagonist, Jason, or even his girlfriend, Deborah, played by Michelle Morgan. I don't feel like these are people that are actually like in a relationship together. 
You know right. what I mean? Like there's nothing about any of these people that feels as if they like one another, if they're friends. I mean, there is sort of that adversarial relationship between Jason being the director and then his actors who are like basically reluctant. They're just there to get a credit or something like that um, or mm -hmm. credit for their class or a movie credit. But yeah, there's really no part of the narrative that works for me, which mm -hmm. in saying that, it's surprising how much I actually enjoyed this movie, despite of the fact I don't care about the characters. I don't care about who survives. They're all basically just body count number for me. But yeah. I think that that speaks more to Romero's strengths as a filmmaker, just because structurally the movie is so sound and the different mm -hmm. ways in which he applies his uh, zombie vision or certain elements that he's done in the past to a new found footage format. And it doesn't feel redundant to what he's done previously, which mm -hmm. I think is something that you can say about Romero in all of his zombie films. Yeah, they're all movies about zombies, and yet none of them are alike. And they've, if anything, in my opinion, gotten better and better with each of them. I mean, through Night of the Living Dead to Dawn to Day to Land. I mean, right. but yeah, no, the characters and the narrative for this do very little for me, but... Um, I think that, again, like, it's just a strength of his in really focusing on the presentation and making this feel as if it isn't like other found footage movies. And I think that that has a lot to do with his decision to go with the cinematographer and mm -hmm. having a much more cinematic feel to the overall film mm -hmm. that it really does feel like a documentary more so almost than the taking of Deborah Logan. How do you feel about that? Yeah, no, I, I, would, I would very much agree with you, right? I mean, again, the relationships in here, it doesn't even feel forced. It just feels like there is none. I mean, you can look at, you know, you mentioned the uh, the filmmaker Jason Creed and um, Deborah uh, Moynihan or whatever, the, the main girl that's in there. You can also think of like that, uh, the Texas girl and the jock at the, at the original, uh, original first half of the movie and how he dies, it just, I don't know there's it doesn't actually feel like there's any kind of real emotion between them it does kind of feel to to that effect uh, staged um so you know again you when you look at it from that lens it's very easy for people to you know give this movie shit for 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 that in that sense right i mean i think it only had a 5.6 imdb rating um so again i think it's if you're looking for like a blood and a gore type of a zombie movie, this is by no means it, right? Um, there's a lot gorier, there's a lot better uh, cinema, or not necessarily cinematography, but like CGI effects in other zombie movies than, th than this is. I think this movie was solely, at least in my opinion, it was more focused on the message that's underlying of Diary of the Dead rather than the overt blood and gore that we're kind of used to seeing even in like night of the living dead there's a very iconic scene where um the i'm forgetting the young couple but their car blows up and zombies are like eating the pieces of like you know their arms and legs mm. and stuff like that right yeah i don't remember one even remotely close scene like like that in this movie right i mean there's startling scenes where like how you know zombies quote unquote are being left but there's nothing ever where like a horde of zombies or somebody gets eaten in some kind of a weird way that's typically i don't know if routine is the best way of putting it but you're expecting that in a romero movie you know yeah I, i'm glad you brought this up so we'll get into some of the zombie stuff and then i do want to circle back just to the documentary feel of the movie but i would i, I agree with what you're saying largely it's just that the focus is not on mowing down waves of zombies. It's not on these super practical kill centric moments. There is a good amount, I think, of up close and personal zombie kills that lend themselves to the found footage genre in a way that, or the found footage presentation where it doesn't feel like just cheap jump scares where it's like a zombie's running into the camera, which was very much my fear going into the movie was, mm -hmm. oh, it's gonna be nothing but zombies running and screaming into the camera suddenly. But that was actually not the reality of the film, which was very refreshing. And while that's not the focus of the film in terms of like zombie carnage and killing zombies and all these things, there are a lot of very, 
There's fewer kills, but I feel that each kill is memorable in some way. Even the sort of like simple kills, like a zombie getting shot in the head, it feels like there's a lot more impact behind that just because of the scenario that they're in. There's one gun, there's one zombie, but then there's this humor sensibility that Romero inserts into the film, both in the dialogue, which doesn't necessarily work for me all the time. Like we said, kind of like characters themselves are not that interesting. So when they deliver like this line that's supposed to be a laugh, I'm just kind of like, whatever. Um, but in terms of like applying that humor to the kills, like in one scene, a character grabs the defibrillator um, and basically like shocks a zombie to the point their eyes explode and their brains leak out of their eyes, which is a hilarious moment and a cool sort of like CGI moment. And then you also have a moment where like a character doesn't have a gun, so he takes a jar of acid and smashes it on the zombie's head. Then you see the zombie's head just slowly mm. leak. And it's basically like him backing up, avoiding the zombie until the acid leaks through its brain and kills it. And I think that there's lots of little moments like that that are entertaining and yet they aren't the focal point of the experience. Um, what did you think of sort of the creativity of the kills? Because I think that again, even though there aren't a lot, each of them are pretty memorable, especially the farther into the film we get. And now for a brief intermission. If you've been enjoying this episode of Daily Horror Habit, please take a moment to subscribe to the show on your preferred streaming platform or leave us a review on iTunes. And thank you for your continued support and I hope you enjoy the remainder of today's horrifying episode. I think we see a handful of of pistol kills for sure, like where they shoot someone in the head. But yeah, I mean, to your point, uh, when the professor was like shooting the bow and arrows at um, Deborah's family when they get to Scranton. Yeah. Yeah, that was pretty cool. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll be fair. He like shoots her younger brother against the wall. Like he's like skewers him against the wall, which yeah, is which... super fucked up. But I mean, in terms of a film that uses a lot of C, not a lot, but more CGI than maybe most people would like. Yeah. I felt like it wasn't that distracting considering it's each kill is so personable in mm -hmm. terms of like the presentation of it. And I mean, it, like the camera zooms in on and things like that. It didn't seem super distracting for me at least. Uh, no, was it? I mean, again, it's, it's what you're expecting in a zombie film, right? I mean, for the most part, when you're going into a zombie film, you're expecting somebody, you're expecting lots of blood and gore. And even in those situations, you're not, it's nothing overt, right? Like when the, you know, even in the scene that you described, right? When the eyes burst out of the head, it's not like blood is everywhere and, you know, the zombie, it just collapses. Mm -hmm. So like, but then it, the zombie gets back up and it's more like cinematic to that effect. Like it is nowhere near the uh, the level of like description, at least costume design wise, like a Walking Dead or even Land of the Dead. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's again to that effect. I don't I, I'm pretty sure the budget uh, that they were working on was a little bit smaller than some of his other movies. But for sure, um, yeah, definitely. It by by no means did a, a big portion of this movie seem to go towards like the costume design or the blood and gore effects in that in that way. Yeah, you, well, this is a much smaller movie. Like Romero, I think, is on record saying that after Land of the Dead, which was a studio film, and I think that he said it was his largest film in terms of the scale and the scope um, compared oh. to what he had done previously in the Dead series. And so he wanted to return to the more intimate, small scale. And I think in terms of that, if you were just looking at the film um, objectively in those terms, I think it really does that well in making the most of a smaller scale, right? I think that there's a lot more memorable moments, um, even if they aren't sort of like hordes of zombies, again, like in Land of the Dead or something like that. And yet each instance is somewhat memorable, whether it be a cool CGI kill or whether it be a bit of humor. Like there's two kills um, that are humor filled that really stood out to me as being hilarious in that when they're in, uh, I think they're in Scranton, Pennsylvania, and they stumble upon this Amish guy's barn and it's a deaf Amish guy who throws dynamite at zombies. Like that's a hilarious moment to me. Like why the fuck is that a, a, uh, milestone in this film? And yet it's hilarious. Cause it's like, yeah, it's some Amish guy who chucks TNT at zombies. Like there's no backstory or explanation for that. And yet it's a hilarious kill. And then follow that up with, he gets bit and he's got a scythe. And instead of sort of just killing the zombie, he skewers the zombie that's behind him by like 
stabbing himself in the face with a scythe and skewering the zombie. Like, it's so over-the-top violent, but it's memorable, right? It's a memorable death. It's not him sort of, like, shooting a zombie and then shooting himself in the head. It's like, no, I'm going to spear myself with the scythe to get this motherfucker that just uh, ensured my death. So I think that Romero's injection of humor, at least in terms of the kills, Mm -hmm. provided some levity in this that, I mean, he's always sort of had quirky sensibilities in his films and in the stories and in characters. And so to see that play out in the deaths, I think it was a smart decision just because if I had to spend any more time with these characters and listen to them say anything else, (laughs) I probably would have tuned out even more, but no. Um, But I think uh, in terms of like the zombie kills, especially, I mean, whether it's the bow and arrow or if it's um, there's that awesome kill where the professor finds like a sword in the mansion that they eventually arrive at and he stabs the zombie in the face with it and then like decapitates it or splits its head in half. And I mean, there's lots of little memorable moments that I can see why general zombie fans would probably not be the biggest fan just because of how few kills there are in the film. Right. And yet, in terms of making a film that feels smaller in scale, and with that smaller scale, it feels more realistic, right? These are scared kids and a drunk professor. So the idea that they're going to kill 100 zombies in this movie right, is not. ridiculous. It doesn't fit with the type of movie that's making. So I find that the zombies and the violence and things like that really fit the small scale, even if they aren't necessarily like the best I've ever seen effects-wise or creative-wise. In terms of this film, I think it's fairly effective. So, I mean, to your point, right? It didn't need to be more than it was. Right. Right. Like, I understand why people would have an issue with it. Because, again, I'm one of those people that I love seeing a bunch of blood and guts. But if you're looking for that, it's this is not the film. But if you're looking for an underlying message, which they continuously go back to this of like, what is going on in the news? versus what are they seeing like um i i think she uh she mentioned she had seen a video of like the girl in korea who's saying like there's zombies there as well right and she found on a youtube message board which i was like man i do not remember (laughs) that that is uh those are the wild west days of youtube (laughs) you're not wrong yeah um so like It was interesting to hear some of the dialogue pertaining to the technology of that day. I mean, even though we lived through that, I do not recall some of it. Um, But continuously going back to that, that distrust of the news, distrust of what the government is saying and seeing a different perspective from these, you know, these YouTubers basically that were just going and uploading their own messages of what was going on, how to um, you know, how to potentially protect yourself or um, what exactly the, the real scoop on the situation was, right? So, I mean, it was very interesting. And again, coming back to where we are now and applying those that, that message or that uh, underlying kind of theme to what we're going, to, going through now in the United States or in the world in general, like he was very much onto something in terms of like, how distrustful people are of general news and how easy it is to you know have somebody who posts something on youtube get it believed whether it's true or not um so it's you know that that to me was something that um just really stood out of like how how far ahead his message really was impactful you know that's one of the things i think that is so remarkable about romero and in my getting to explore more of his filmography because Admittedly, I hadn't seen much of his films outside of the Dead uh, series. And so it's very refreshing to come to Diary of the Dead and seeing just how grounded as not only a filmmaker, but like a person he is. And earlier I described him as being very sort of boots on the ground in terms of the shifting tides within whether it be society or sort of people's sensibilities and how technology is sort of having an effect on society. Mm -hmm. And it's so refreshing to see an older filmmaker make a movie that is focused around technology, which a majority of his films were not about. Mm -hmm. And to see him incorporate his messaging in a way that it's, it, this is a cynical movie, but it's not like, it's not him rejecting 
uh, technology or saying technology is to blame. The commentary he makes is more about people. And it's not so much him demonizing technology, it's him uh, taking technology and showing how people are going to use it. And mm -hmm. I think that that's an important distinction to make, right? It's, is he demonizing people or technology? And I think that he's demonizing people and in doing so, like, especially once we'll get into the, how the film ends, I mean, it's a commentary more on people and how people react to things and sort of like people's primal behaviors and whatnot. And he's not blaming technology for anything. I, I have found that some older filmmakers, when they start to tell narratives that are based around technology and how technology shapes us fundamentally, mm -hmm. it starts to be like technology is ruining us. Whereas Romero is like, hey, people have always been sort of going down a certain path. And if it takes an apocalyptic event for those primal, uh, whether it be urges or just behaviors in general to kind of come to light, it's more the, the uh, burden of blame lies on people more so than technology. And to see him tell a story that is so technology focused and this again, this idea of like emerging media mm -hmm. and to actually have an understanding of how these things could be used is so incredibly refreshing. And it is the one element of the narrative that again ties into the documentary structure that is not only refreshing, but it doesn't feel dated. Mm -hmm. This is an old movie. This is a, four, uh, I believe, a 14 year old movie. And yeah. the idea that this movie could have came out, I mean, granted, you'd have to update like the quality of everything in terms right. of like the webcam or the handheld cameras and stuff. But the point that he's making and the way that he's utilizing technology to make those points mm -hmm. is hasn't it, it's not dated at all because it is so relevant to where we're at now. Mm -hmm. And I mean, again, you there are certain things that are left to be desired, so to speak, in this movie. But I did really appreciate how the very beginning they're shooting a scene basically where uh, this guy is a mummy and he's chasing, um, the, uh, I believe her name is Tracy Thurman, played by Amy LaLonda. Um, she's the, the Texan girl. And he, it starts with him basically like trying to catch her. And like, I believe she, she put it as like rip off her blouse or something like that, right? And literally at the very end, it's actually doing that again, except yeah. he's like actually dead this time. Right. Um, That's that I, Romero humor. I mean, you're not wrong. Yeah. And I mean, like that kind of thing, coupled with the fact that, I mean, I don't know about you. I actually really did enjoy the ending. Sans like two or three things that happened along the way, which were, I mean, just my logical brain was like, this would never happen this way. Um, aside from like a couple of very questionable scenes. Um, I mean, honestly, I really enjoyed the way this ended. Did, did you have a similar kind of thought on that or was it um, kind of up in the air for you? Yeah. Again, like I think that the ending serves his messaging, right? And that is the big theme of the film is this idea of, do humans basically like, do they deserve to survive this? Mm -hmm. Are we, is it worthwhile for humanity to survive or is this the great reset that the planet needs? Mm -hmm. Because it's this idea that like, yeah, society is this violent, ever evolving, but violent society. And it's kind of this idea that it's like, okay, so people are gonna survive, but then are people going to just increasingly become hostile towards one another? And is society basically going to have this, this, uh, this cancerous sort of violent streak continue to fester amongst the population? And so that is represented by the idea that the film ends with these two hunters, basically, who I think they've made like a shooting range out of zombies, mm -hmm. basically. And there's that last shot where there's a zombie that I think they're ha it's hanging from a noose, and they shoot her, it. It was, it was her hair. It was. Oh, woman. it was her hair. Okay. Yeah. So they shoot her in the face, but they don't destroy the brain. So that way it, from the, I think it's just the eyes up mm -hmm. are remaining hanging from the tree. And so the, I mean, the narrator basically asks like, are we worth saving? And I think that that's a very fitting ending because it ties into the messaging, but really it's a callback to this film's structure as a documentary. And something that I wanted to bring up earlier is just throughout the film, there are these 
sort of like montages of scenes that have already happened in the film with a narration over it. That mm -hmm. is a very kind of documentary style, uh, stylistic choice, mm -hmm. which is, you can see that, find that in any documentary, whether it be sort of like B-roll footage and then somebody's commentating on it or making sort of this uh, philosophical point or sort of just a, uh, attempting to tackle this like moral quandary. Mm -hmm. And that whole element is persistent throughout the entire film. And mm -hmm. I think that that does a really, really good job of utilizing the found footage format and proving why Diary of the Dead could only be a found footage film, even with the cinematic uh, elements that the film has that eludes a lot of other, well, it doesn't elude it because maybe f other filmmakers don't want that, but the choice to go with the cinematographer instead of having the cast film it, despite that and that sort of like uh, very constructed presentation, it still feels like this has to be a found footage film that this story unfolds in. If they didn't have the found footage angle, I don't know how well this would have played out because there's a lot that is gained from that very specific presentation mm -hmm. that had they tried to do this as if it were just a traditional film, I really don't know how well this would have worked. No, I agree. And one thing that you said, by the way, just really kind of, I don't know, it just, it, it kind of threw me into a, another movie that we had, had seen and spoken about in the past. But um, you mentioned how like, do humans deserve to go through, you know, survive this, uh, this situation, right? The great reset. And, um, you know, you, I think you alluded to something akin to like, um, are humans going to continuously like attack one another? And it reminded me of something in 28 days later there, um, like the group is now with the army soldiers and they're sitting eating eating dinner and like the general there is, is talking about uh i think one of the girls had asked him a question of like when will things return to normal and he goes i mean people are attacking people and that's been happening for thousands of years so what i'm seeing right now is nothing but normal it's so what we've been dealing with for thousands of years and so like that just kind of made me think of that of like kind of the the original theme of zombies is like it's an it creates an enemy for humans but at the end of the day we will always no matter what situation arises we typically will become our own worst enemies um and so i don't know what, what you just said kind of really made me think of that but um to to your point and your question i guess was you know, would this film have been as good if it wasn't found footage or in the style that it was? No, I agree. I think there are certain things that you see, whether even if you just look at the very end when you're getting the point of view, uh, point of view shots of like the security cameras, it would be hard to do that if you have like a tradition, a traditional movie, if you're looking, you know, over someone's shoulder while they're looking at that or something like that. Right. Um, what did like, the way that it ended in terms of like they basically you know that rich guy is was he was his hand bit before that whole situation went down yeah so basically our survivors end up at the mansion of one of the kids from the very beginning of the film mm -hmm. who basically has spent the entire zombie apocalypse at his parents mansion and then you find out his entire family got infected and then he threw all their bodies in the pool and whatnot because they were zombies, but he got bit in the process. Mm -hmm. And so the survivors essentially like ride out the zombie apocalypse inside the safe room that's there. There's like this high dude, uh, highly technical facility basically that has a safe room in the house. And so they ride that out and then they obviously publish the documentary posthumously for Josh who passes away because he gets bit and infected and uh, his girlfriend ends up shooting him in the head. Um, so yeah, he was bit was, before that. Was that the dumbest death you saw on this or were there? I mean, there that's one? one of that's one of the elements of the film that I think is pretty weak in terms of just like the narrative beats of this film. It yeah. feels like it's just, okay, so you've got a group of survivors going to check on loved ones. They show up, the loved ones are tragically infected. They have to kill their loved ones. They come to terms with that. They deal with different members that are in the society now that are sort of creating this new um, new mini societies and power struggles and things like that. You see the National Guard break up. And I mean, 
this is one of the main sort of very much on the nose sort of social commentary things I think that Romero was doing, whether intentional or not. You see that the National Guard basically is disbanded, right? And there's one of these characters that the entire film, he keeps saying, oh, the army's going to save us and all this kind of like uh, typical apocalypse mantra. Mm -hmm. And then we see that initially the group, this big air quotes, gets jumped by a group of African-Americans with guns that are like hostile up front. And you assume that these guys are about to rob them because they have guns on them. They're telling them to put their stuff down and then they force them to come with them. Mm -hmm. But then these guys end up being the saviors. And I'm saying that you would assume what they're going to do because of the way the film frames it. Mm -hmm. And so once you get to the base where these guys are from, you realize, oh, these are actually people that are like helping the community. And mm -hmm. there's a really fantastic line there that one of our survivors asks these National Guardsmen or these ex-National Guardsmen, like, why are you staying here? And they're like, why wouldn't we stay here? This is the first time in our lives we've had power in this area or we've had some semblance of authority. Mm -hmm. And that's a very, very Romero socially conscious moment to have, especially when you contrast it to the experience of when our survivors run into the white National Guardsmen who yeah. are like, they also draw guns on them, but then they rob them. Mm -hmm. And all they do is give them, they get to keep their guns essentially. Mm -hmm. And so like that contrast, I think is very on the nose in terms of just like, we're going to flip your maybe kind of just the cinema stereotypes, you know what I mean? On mm -hmm. the head. But in terms of Romero, like that's in line with his sensibilities going, dating all the way back to Night of the Living Dead. And so in that regard, I think that is probably the most standout sort of uh, plot element or story beat. But then everything outside of that is so kind of just cliched. It's exactly what you'd expect. The family gets eaten and then, oh, there's somebody hiding the fact that they're infected and then they end up killing somebody. Then no. you have to kill that. Like that whole element, again, it fuels sort of how weak the narrative of this film is. And yet I'm coming back to the presentation. The presentation is so strong and Romero's handling of technology social consciousness around technology. And I kind of want to take it back for a minute to something you said earlier that I didn't get a chance to comment on was you were talking about a mistrust of the news. And there's an interesting line in the film where somebody says, yeah, you can't trust the news anymore. And then another character says, well, is it that we can't trust the news or is it that the government is lying to them? And I think that that's a really interesting conversation to have, especially in 2007. Mm -hmm. Whereas, I mean, within the last handful of years, we've been having conversations in politics and things about like, we've had politicians saying you can't trust the media. And then we've had people saying, hey, we can't sure shit can't trust politicians. Right. And so for Romero to tackle an issue like that in a zombie film of all things and saying like, well, is the media lying or is the information they're getting from liars? I think that's a really interesting conversation that it's only ever really surface level, right? It's kind of like, hey, we can't trust what we're hearing from anybody because the government's saying this will be, I actually laughed out loud when the government was like, oh, things will be back to normal in no time. I was like, oh, in COVID times, when have we heard that pretty frequently? Um, but in terms of comparing like relationships with the government and with the media, I think it's interesting that the film hammers home in a really interesting way you have to trust one another. You have to trust your sit fellow citizens and whatnot, which is why these characters go to YouTube, which I think is hilarious just in terms of like where we're at now, this idea that we need to be able to relate to other people and we can get our firsthand information from other people. Um, I'm kind of ranting a little bit about, <laughs> to go off of your question, but um, I think that that is an element of the film that really resonated with me in a way that um, I was, again, not expecting it to. I was kind of expecting sort of just a schlocky, regular zombie movie that was being applied to the found footage genre. Not to say that I'm like, that I would throw shade at George Romero, but I mean, in terms of looking at this film from afar and what I knew about his career at that time period. And again, mm -hmm. at the time, I was not a fan of Land of the Dead. Now, obviously revisiting it, and we actually talked about it for uh, my Masters of Horror series. I really enjoyed Land of the Dead now, but I avoided Diary of the Dead back in the day because I did not enjoy Land of the Dead. And so to really get to revisit his work and to see a lot of his 
prevalent themes and social commentary pop up in this in a really, um, not rich, but um, just an effective way that hasn't dated at all is fantastic, I think. Well, one thing that you said, um, you would never throw shade at Romero. Uh, I am about to have to break that on the show, unfortunately. There was one thing that I, I, it doesn't matter how much I might in, have enjoyed this movie in retrospect or how much I love Romero as a director. The fact that the blonde Texas girl, Tracy, just like legit just hops into that RV and just drives off and nobody, like they literally just go, oh fuck, and then that's it. That's <laughs> the only like acknowledgement we get to that. There was no, like, it's not like she was g going somewhere. There was any plan. She literally was just like, fuck this, I'm out of here. It just drove off. No food, no guns in there, nothing. I, I don't know. That was to me, like, as as many ridiculous sins that I have, have sat through, my logical mind was just like, she's literally going to die in the next, like, 35 minutes in real life. If that Again, happens. though, that's an element, I think, of the narrative, right? And the narrative is this is probably the weakest narrative of his that I've seen in terms of the dead series, right? This is definitely the weakest narrative and it's more about what he's saying rather than what he's having his characters say. Um, yeah, again, like the characters themselves, they're all just basically like very trope heavy. Mm -hmm. um, I don't necessarily find any of them endearing or even funny. Like the professor even has that line when Tracy has to kill her boyfriend where he's like, oh, I guess he flunked out of film school or something to that effect. And I was just yeah. like, okay. Like, I just was like rolling my eyes to the point there in the back of my head. But um, yeah, I don't know. I think that it's it's very interesting that I'm talking so positively about a film where I literally could not give a shit about the story or the characters. I mean, that is a real testament to Romero as a filmmaker, especially yeah. his first foray into found footage. I mean, in terms of, the sort of documentary style of this film, I think that this is done in a way that's even better than Deborah Logan. I think it's, in, I'm bringing it back to Deborah Logan because we talked about it last week, but I think Deborah Logan has a more narratively and character driven involvement in that, that I really, really like. And that is the drive. Whereas it's almost feels like Romero has really perfected the implementation of the documentary found footage style, which I really, really like. Um, how did you feel about that in comparing those two? Just because we will, I would never normally not compare those two films, but since we just talked about it last week, I thought it'd be interesting to ask. Uh, I mean, they obviously have two very different purposes that they're mm -hmm. shooting for, right? Or aims. Sure. I think that you, you said it kind of the best, uh, originally when you made the, uh, the comparison, they're both, really good found footage films in the way that they're shot but this is a better documentary found footage than than taking of deborah logan was also deborah logan came out seven years after that i've i have such a horrible frame of reference for found footage now that like i had seen some of the like major ones which was like cloverfield and then i saw obviously paranormal activity and things to that extent vhs and uh, uh poughkeepsie tapes but like in getting to uncover more of the sort of gems or misfires within found footage like my perception of because for me when i think about film genres you know you have the big milestones right whether it be like slashers home invasion body whatever subgenre you are dabbling in there's those major milestone films and remarkable right. films and yet with found footage like i have no perception of like when things were released in uh, relation to one another so like i know the the air quotes, the first Blair Witch Project, and then we have like Paranormal Activity 15 at the very end of the spectrum kind of thing. Um, but yeah, it's interesting. I, th I would definitely agree with what you said, obviously, in that um, Deborah Logan, I think, is a more than adequate continuation of a documentary focused style found footage, mm -hmm. where it is very specifically like, hey, this is a documentary structure we're capturing B-roll footage, we're capturing live footage, there's narration in these things, but I feel that the Diary of the Dead really does that to a degree that you feel, you almost forget sometimes that you're watching a documentary and that it's so seamlessly shifts between first person accounts and then narration that's kind of like lending to the documentary's overall themes and whatnot, which 
it has a structure that is, there's nothing unrealistic or sort of shortchanged in terms of like trying to convey what an actual documentary is. Um, right. And so for that, it's just astounding that Romero was able to do that with certain elements of his filmmaking sort of vernacular that he's acquired over the entire course of his career. And so to get to see him really come into that element and apply that in a way that we hadn't seen before and to go the unconventional uh, route and have a cinematographer not let the actors film it themselves, you would almost think like, oh, is something going to be lost in that? Right. But really, I mean, how do you feel about the film's handling of the multiple camera perspectives and whatnot? Uh, I mean, I think that there, there are films that you will watch where it'll make you a little bit queasy with the, mm -hmm. the, the constant changing of views and things like that. I think you, you again, you kind of hit it on the, the nose uh, as you were kind of elaborating on it a, a couple minutes back. It does a very seamless job of switching between points of view to the point where even if it's going from, you know, I, I don't know why I'm kind of harping on this end piece, but if it's, you know, at the end where there's two cameras, they also are going between the actual um, the security camera angles and things like that. And they keep interchanging that mm -hmm. and there's action shots in between. It's not just like small little things. Um, it made it actually seem like I was watching more, like you said, a documentary film yeah. rather than like a movie. And I don't know, it was, it's a very, the way that you framed it, framed it in that way, like, now looking back on it, I wasn't really just kind of sitting back and watching it like a like I was a, a taking a Deborah Logan. It was, I don't know, it was just a more unique kind of uh, way to watch it. Um, so I, I definitely liked it. Yeah, definitely. yeah. There was there really is something gained from going with the cinematographer rather than having the actors do it because I keep coming back to the way that they capture the action in this film and. You're right that when you have the actors filming themselves, there is this sort of disorienting feeling sort of where you're like jumping between perspectives or like the kind of like dreaded shaky cam. But I, uh, on my own, we didn't talk about it, but I watched the 2000, I believe it's 16 Blair Witch uh, reboot that they did that introduces multiple cameras in that narrative, which I think is great. Mm -hmm. But the way that they handled the transition between lenses I really did not like because there's almost like every time the camera perspective shifts, there's this static burst that is sort of signifying to the audience that, Hey, you're looking through a new lens and we're jumping from one to the other. And there's like a static on the camera lens. And then there's like a static sound sort of thing. And it became very disorienting, especially with how frequently it jumps between lenses mm -hmm. to the point that you almost lose sense of, sort of like the uh, the area of scenes almost. This idea that like you're jumping around so much, you don't get an idea of what the actual layout of this environment is because you're jumping around so sporadically. And with this film, I never felt that. And I think that that's because, especially like in the hospital scene, right? When they uh, show up because May shoots herself in the face and somehow doesn't kill herself. But that's besides the point. We won't get into that too much. Uh, <laughs> there's this moment where they get jumped by a zombie, right? And it jumps between two different camera perspectives. But then there's also this cinematic angle that is nobody filming mm -hmm. that captures just the action. And I really love that element because even though we know that there's no cameraman there, you never get lost in what's happening, right? It, the action is cinematically framed. So you don't lose an instance of what's happening. And it, you get to capitalize on that in a way that you don't in some found footage movies, right? There's sort of like the camera lingers on something and then it snaps away right away, or somebody gets hit and falls and the camera shakes and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Whereas you are in the action in Diary of the Dead in a way that I think is really, really satisfying, at least in the presentation wise, even if what characters are saying or their objectives, you don't give a fuck about, the way that the whole story is being presented is really quite impressive for what it is. and it kind of just dispels all of my preconceived notions. Oh, this is going to be a director trying to get in on the new hot subgenre, which was completely false on my part. But yeah. I mean, I'm very, very impressed, especially the more we're talking about it, like how he's able to convey his styles and sensibilities 
And even if the characters are probably some of the worst that he's written, I think. Yeah, I agree. I still feel that this is a film that stands up far better than, I won't say that it should, but it definitely defied my expectations in a pretty big way, considering I had very low expectations. But right. how do you how do you feel about uh, Diary of the Dead overall? So I, I will say this, right? I think it depends on the style of, of movie you're trying to watch. I think if you're looking for uh, an action-packed type of a, a zombie movie, probably not your thing. If you're looking for something that has like really interesting character arcs, obviously not your thing as well. But if you're just looking for... I mean, this was... I don't know. I think we all sometimes need like a mindless movie in a sense. It just kind of carries you from point A to point B. And if there's a message that you want to take from it, great. And if not, then at least it's a, a semi entertaining movie. This is entertaining to, to an extent, right? Um, what would you say? Or would you give this a yay or a nay in terms of uh, recommending it for people to watch? I would definitely recommend it. Even though I said earlier, it's not one of my favorite Romero's and it's definitely not one of my favorite um yeah, it's not one of my favorite found footage films, but I think that if you are a fan of Romero and you're a fan of found footage, there's no reason why, if especially if this is streaming free on Tubi, that if you need something to watch, you should definitely check it out because I think that you, you use the word mindless and I would say that the characters and the narrative are more boilerplate and yeah, the characters are pretty mindless, but presentation wise, the film is very engaging, I think. I think that while certain elements might be, you could maybe say that they're mindless, the film itself does not feel mindless, right? It feels very thoroughly constructed in a way that there was a lot of intention in the way that they chose to tell the story with that format. Um, so I would definitely recommend that people check this out. Even, I mean, even if it was like a $2 rental or something and you're interested in both Romero movies and found footage, I think it's worth watching. I, I think you need to set your expectations. Like you said, it's, I would almost draw certain parallels between this and Day of the Dead. And while Day of the Dead is, has recently become one of my favorite Romero films, um, or at least in terms of the Dead trilogy or the Dead series, um, that is a film that, again, like I feel that a lot of people have slept on or maybe more general audiences sleep on because it's not about the body count. It's more about characters and society and how this apocalypse is is it changing people or is it allowing people to tap into who they've always been? And they just had to abide by certain uh, laws of society and whatnot, or certain um, the structural settings of society. Whereas mm -hmm. this film, again, this film is not about the body count. This film is about presenting the apocalypse through a unique lens. And I think that in that regard, this film definitely succeeds at that. And um, it's definitely worth checking out. And if you're somebody that was like me, that was like, Oh, there's no way that this guy is going to come into this new format and be able to kind of re or not reuse, but tap into sort of his filmmaking vernacular while not sort of like verbatim uh, expounding something he's already done before. Don't be like me because this film will definitely succeed. Well, maybe you should be going with like me because I walked away being very impressed with this. Um, mm -hmm. So if you had a stupid preconceived notion like I did, you'll probably enjoy this movie more than you thought you would. So I would definitely recommend it. Mm -hmm. Well, Mazel Well, I mean, uh, you know, excited to, to see what this episode, movie we, we come to up Daily with Horror next Habit on this. And uh, see if we service, give a, another year and follow year the show on Instagram at Daily yeah, Horror Habit. Hey, as always, on Twitter at Daily Horror, horror Pod for episode updates. Thanks again for listening. I'll see you guys next time. Appreciate it, brother.